Welcome to There is a Method to the Madness. My name is Rob Maxwell. I'm an exercise physiologist and personal trainer. I'm the owner of Maxwell's Fitness Programs, and I've been in business for the past 30 years, since 1994. The purpose of this podcast is to use science and get to the real deal of what really works and most importantly, why it works. Hence the name, There is a Method to the madness. We're going to have some fun today as usual talking about all things fitness and wellness. Before I get to that, let me thank Jonathan and Lynn Gilden of the Gilden Group at Realty Pros. They currently have over 280 five-star reviews on Zillow. And you know what? Realty Pros is number one in Volusia County. And Jonathan and his beautiful wife, Lynn, are my real estate folks. So if you need any help, give them a shout at 386 386- Four five one two four one two. Let's get down to fitness. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about machines. Good old selectorized resistance machines. I was on the leg extension machine this morning and I was doing uh, my quad extensions, of course. And I was thinking about how so many people really don't understand the value of selectorized machines. Let's take that one simple machine all by itself, the leg extension machine. I'm not exaggerating when I say that that probably has been the greatest exercise for my knees through the years. I mean, I can remember back in my 20s first having an overuse injury of the patella, some chondromalacia, which is just simply some roughened cartilage underneath the patella. And um, I started seeing Dr. Fulton and we talked and he knew what I did. And, you know, he convinced me that basically I had a imbalance of the quadriceps and I needed to really isolate my medialis more. And I started doing that doing my leg extensions like I did, but really, really faithfully and just making sure that I kept that as a primary exercise for my legs. And, um, you know, my knees are really, really, really good. I mean, we all get aches and pains and I go through mine as well, but that exercise has been more effective for me through the years and then working with clients as well. I see a lot of people for different kinds of aches and pains and to strengthen particular joints. And it's never failed. Like every time I have somebody with different kinds of knee issues, whether it be meniscus tears or ACL tears or chondromalacia like I've had, or let's see, patella tendonitis, you name it. When we get to the point where we're getting into leg extensions and what that means is They're out of pain and they're now really able to start strengthening the joints. Their knees always get better. And don't worry, this isn't an entire podcast on the leg extension machine, but I'm using it as a great example of what selectorized machines can do. And the reason why it has helped so many is because it's the only exercise that can absolutely isolate the vastus medialis. I mean, it isolates the quads, which are four muscles, but it really isolates the vastus medialis, which is the teardrop muscle, which is the muscle that is responsible for a lot of the knee mobility, and in particular, the tracking of the the kneecap. So when you're able to really isolate the quads, and isolate means isolate. It means to only use that muscle by itself. When you're able to isolate it and make that specific muscle group stronger, the knee itself is going to be stronger. Now, free weights are great. I love free weights. I mean, the benefits to free weights is, especially dumbbells, you can do them anywhere. If you have a set of, say, 5, 10, and 15 pounds, or 3, 6, and 8, whatever, depending on your strength levels, you can pretty much train your entire body wherever you go. That's great. But machines are the only exercises really where you can really, really isolate with the load that you need. 
So there really isn't a good or bad because I think all forms of resistance training are great, whether it be selectorized machines, dumbbells, or barbells, or resistance bands. All forms of resistance is great. But I think too often selectorized machines kind of get pushed to the rear of the room a lot, which is silly because obviously they're the largest and biggest and most expensive. But what has happened through the years is, and it's like so many things that I talk about, it's not really the educated voices that are out there screaming things. It's influencers of sorts and people that only understand a piece of science and they really start running with their particular piece even though it's kind of like half cocked meaning not really all the way correct right so what's happened in the last maybe 10 years or maybe a little bit longer is this huge push called functional training a lot of people talk about it now people that don't even understand it i see it all the time I'll get on social media, I'll open up my Instagram account, and somebody will be yelling at me about functional training. He'll say something to the effect of, no, oh, don't do these, you know, leg extensions. We don't walk around doing this motion all the time. You've got to do this. And he'll show like maybe a squat or a variation of a squat. And he'll go on to talk about how that's functional training. And... The term has been hijacked quite a bit by people who do CrossFit, and I don't mean all CrossFit, and I'm definitely not knocking CrossFit. I know people that do it as a sport, and they really, really enjoy it. And hey, man, that's cool. If you're getting stronger, and you're having fun, and you're staying more fit, you know, more power to you. But like with every group, there are people that try to sell their thing above all other things. And so there has been some loud voices coming out of the CrossFit community kind of stating the same thing. They'll say things like, well, don't go to the gym and do a lot of those bodybuilding movements. And they might be talking about curls and flies and things that create hypertrophy, meaning bigger muscles. They'll say you need to do functional things. And they'll, they'll oftentimes show a weightlifting exercise like a clean and jerk, which there is absolutely nothing functional about that exercise. Or they'll show maybe a power clean or, or whatever. And they'll talk about the functionality of it. Look, functionality is true. We want to do functional things. But a lot of what they're talking about and a lot of what the influence are talking about are not functional things. Like, Functional things have to have specificity to it, meaning are they specific to the actual thing that you do? So a squat is a functional exercise. There is no question about it. To get up and down out of a chair is a squat. So if you can do a squat with load, you are definitely doing a functional exercise. There is absolutely no question about that. But oftentimes, when they're saying you need to do more functional things, there is absolutely nothing functional about a clean and jerk, for example. A clean and jerk is where you pick a load off the floor explosively to your chest and then press it over your head. I mean, we don't do that. And the, I mean, in daily life, right? I mean, we don't walk around and do that type of thing. What they're really trying to say is that more compound exercises, so exercises that require more than one joint, are more functional. There is some truth to that. But let me tell you something else. Having strong individual muscles is extremely functional. Research has shown that the greatest indicator of strength is cross-sectional muscle area. All right? You might be saying... So what? I mean, what are you saying that nobody else is? That says a lot. So what that means is that no matter what the exercise is, if the area has the most muscle fibers in it, it's going to be stronger. So for example, if we had a room, I'm just going to use men as this example. I'm not being a sexist by any means, but men tend to be stronger, especially in the upper body. So if I had a room full of 20 grown men 
And I was able to do muscle biopsies where I can determine who has the greatest amount of muscle in their individual biceps. So the bicep muscle, I think everybody knows, is the anterior muscle on the upper part of the arm. It's made up the, of the brachialis and the brachioradialis and the bicep brachii. So essentially it's divided up within three muscles there with the brachioradialis going down into the forearm as well. So if I was able to biopsy the anterior arm and determine who had the greatest cross-sectional muscle area of muscle in the bicep, I mean, sure, we could just have everybody roll up their sleeves and, and flex too, yes. But I'm just trying to get very scientific to the point specific. Whoever has the greatest cross-sectional muscle area, so muscle mass, not fat mass, not bone, muscle mass, whoever has the most muscle in that bicep is going to curl, bicep curl, the most weight in the room, regardless if they've ever done a bicep curl before. So it doesn't take functional strength to do an exercise. It takes muscle mass, which creates functional strength to do an exercise. There could be a smaller person in that room who maybe has better technique and has been doing nothing but barbell curls his entire life. I still bet the farm on the guy with the bigger bicep brachii. I mean, of course he has to be shown how to do it. And of course he probably already does. I'm just trying to make a point is going to out curl that guy. So what that means is muscle mass by itself is extremely functional. I started this podcast talking about the leg extension. So if that quad is bigger and the quadricep is made up of four muscles, rectus femoris, vastus lateralis, vastus intermedialis, and vastus medialis. So if those muscles are bigger, they're going to be stronger, i.e. more functional. They are going to be able to squat more weight and get out of chairs, even if they've never done that. And the only way to isolate the quads is by doing a leg extension. Like there are other things we can do in a gym to isolate a muscle. We can isolate our biceps by doing bicep curls. We can isolate our triceps by doing kickbacks. I'm giving you free weight exercises you can do. You can isolate your pecs, which is your chest muscles, by doing flies. And when I mean isolate, for those that don't know, I'll say it again, that means work the single joint function, meaning only work that muscle without the help of other muscle groups. So for example, a chest press is a multi-joint compound exercise, meaning it works more than one muscle group at a time. It's great. Nothing wrong with that. Love it. Or bench press. You're working your pecs, your shoulders, and your triceps. But to isolate means pull one of those muscle groups out and you have to do the primary exercise for it that isolates it. There's a lot of free weight and machine exercises that can isolate a lot of the upper body. But to really isolate the lower body, you need selectorized machines. And they get picked on too much. They get pushed to the back. Oh, don't do leg extensions and leg curls. They're not functional. They need to do squats and deadlifts. I mean, that is so silly. Yes, you probably should do a form of squat and or deadlift, of course. But that's because you do want to hit the glutes and you want to hit the compound exercises. But if you don't do leg extensions and leg curls as well, or at all, you probably are the one in the room that is suffering the most with knee issues and hip issues because you are not isolating the specific muscle groups that need to be isolated. And another one would be the hip abductors, the Audis, people call it. You know, people don't understand exercise science or really strength training much at all. And people will roll their eyes and go, Audis, I only see girls do that. They only want to work their butt. It's like, okay, guys, look, first off, there's no such thing as um, spot reduction. So you can't do an exercise and make an area smaller. So even though people might be doing that exercise for that reason, they're wrong. Everybody should probably be doing the hip abductors because it's the only thing that can isolate your glute medius 
and the glute medius is responsible for your hip mobility and strength. How the heck else are you going to train your glute medius if you never do hip abductors? Now, the answer to that and the answer to the quad isolation and even hamstring isolation can be done through physical therapy when you lay on your side or you lay on your back and you do certain band exercises. So you can do hip abduction. You can do knee extension. You can do knee curl with a band. Now here's the thing. Are you? Are you isolating that? So when you go to your leg works outs, are you sitting down with your tube and doing this stuff? And can you apply enough load? It's a great way to start if you're doing physical therapy to do like the old drag your heel back as you're laying on your back to strengthen your hamstring and your physical therapist is holding the other end of the band and you're pulling back. Yeah, th that's great. But you have to take it a step further and add load. And I'm trying to sell you on the fact that that is why it is so important to use these beautiful, high-priced, very effective, very efficient, selectorized machines in the gym. The leg extensions, the hip abductors, and the leg curls. Because you are not going to be able to isolate those muscles without doing that. And your quads are the strongest muscle groups in the entire body. Bar none. Like most people in my gym are going to be using anywhere, the women anywhere from say 50 to 110 pounds, maybe 40 to 110, even 120 pounds. The guys anywhere from say 70 after they've been working out for a little bit, all the way up to 160 pounds on the leg extension alone. Okay. Show me a band that's going to support that kind of weight. Show me an ankle weight that is going to be 150 pounds. You're like, maybe that's not necessary. Well, if they can do 12 clean reps, then yeah, that's necessary. Like every muscle group needs to be taken close to failure to get stronger. So if it requires that kind of resistance, then yeah, they need that kind of load. And how are you going to get that without the selectorized machine, the beautiful old leg extension machine? Now, I've been throwing around the term a lot, selectorized machine. What you need to understand is that's the name of these machines because you simply select the weight by changing the pin. So they're called selectorized resistance machines. The other things that they have are cams in them. All right. Now, this all started back when Arthur Jones was experimenting with selectorized machines in the late 60s. And then most of it was in the 1970s. He did some brilliant work creating the Nautilus machines. And what a lot of people don't understand is that they have cams. Now, the cams in these machines match the strength curves of your muscles. So in the case of, say, a leg extension, your quads are going to be weakest when they're at full 90 degree flexion. They're going to be strongest at the top end of range of motion. So the cam is set where there's a slight decrease in resistance at the bottom and a slight increase at the top. And it's just simply because the cam is not even. It's not just this linear turn as it goes. It changes as the arc of motion goes. So there's that too that most people don't even understand is in the engineering of these selectorized machines. But that's what they're called as selectorized machines, okay, for that reason. Now, I'll end with telling you this. Everything, not everything, but so many things in health and fitness are like every other industry out there, whether you're buying a car, getting sports watches, um, you know, buying apparel, whatever. Everything is trying to outsell something else. I mean, these companies are in the business to sell things, right? And they know that we, the consumers, need them. So with the functional movement thing that happened about 10 or 15 years ago that was kind of hijacked, there was a big push by the CrossFit market to make what they do seem like necessary and the best way to do it. Now, a big part of that is if you talk to some of these people that early on were starting some of these box gyms and there was one in New York City that became pretty famous and that just means basically like a very, very old fashioned gym with like pull up bars and basically a lot of inexpensive equipment, which is fine. You can work out inexpensive equipment. Don't get me wrong. But it was sold as the panacea. 
that let's get back to the way it used to be and we need to do that by doing all these old-fashioned movements. Now, here's the bottom line. A lot of people were pushing that because they didn't have the resources to outfit themselves with like an expensive Nautilus gym because there is no, no question which one costs more to start. Like each selectorized machine typically costs between three and $5,000 and you're going to have at least 10 to 15 pieces and that's just for one line. A lot of these bigger places have like five, five machines each for each muscle group. So we're talking millions of dollars go into having some of these gyms. Not saying it's necessary. I'm just saying that the competitors don't want to just say, come to our place. We have all you need. And sure, those other places are better because they have more advanced equipment that can isolate your muscles, but come to us anyway. They're not going to say that. What kind of sales pitch is going to push you in the door if you say that? I mean, is that going to work? So they say, no, 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 you need to do this because those leg extensions and those hip abductors and those leg curls and that pec fly machine and that pec pullover machine, you know, yeah, they isolate, but they're not functional. You don't walk around doing that in everyday life. And sadly, too many people go, oh, well, that's true. Well, no, that's not true because they're not telling you, as I said, the exercise science behind it, which is the larger the muscle the greater the cross-sectional muscle size area is. The greatest cross-sectional muscle size area, the greater the strength. The greater the strength, the greater the function. The best way to get that individual muscle stronger is to isolate it. And the best way to isolate it is with the tools that can do it. All right? So when you need to go to the gym, you need to go educated, and go knowing what is absolutely best for you. And again, I love both. I love compound exercises. I love isolation exercises. I love free weights. I love machines. They're all great. But the method to the madness tells you why are you choosing them and when. I mean, there's plenty of compound movements I do. I love squats, but man, I want to keep my knees healthy because I want to be able to run. I want to be able to uh, walk briskly. I want to be able to ride my bike. I want to be able to play pickleball. I want to play sports. I want to play tennis. I want to do what I want to do. I want to climb stairs without pain. To do that, I have to keep my knees strong. And to keep my knees strong, I have to do leg extensions. Okay? So I hope that cleared some things up. Now let me talk about some more strength. The strength of a garage door. I once took my truck and I drove it as hard as I can into an overhead garage door and it didn't even chip the paint, okay? All right, this isn't true. I'm really just trying to see if you're paying attention. But in all seriousness, overhead door is by far the greatest garage door in the state of Florida, and most importantly, they have the, the best, or the best, they have the best customer service. I can call Zach, I can call Jeff about myself or about a customer, and they're on it, man. They fix it, and that, to me, is ideal. So give them a shout at OverheadDoorDaytona.com. <laughs>